And good evening. Thank you very much for joining us tonight. We're super excited to have um, a, a group of people here presenting for us tonight. We're super excited to hear more about uh, Microsoft Docs and all the ways in which you can contribute so you can give back and you can actually make the uh, product a better product. And uh, it's not as hard as you think it is. And uh, we're super excited to have Michael Bender, Josh, um, Sean Weller, Wheeler, I think Wheeler, and uh, Chase Wilson uh, joining us from Microsoft. And uh, take it away, Mike. Awesome. Well, thanks everybody. Thanks, Mike and Bill, for uh, you know putting this together. We've been talking about doing something like this for a while. So uh, you know, great to great to get on a call with the group. And tonight we're going to do things maybe a little bit differently. Um, we're not gonna do any slides. We're just gonna have some talking heads. We're gonna talk about some stuff. We're gonna show you how to do some stuff. And like uh, Phil and Mike both said, if there's any questions, we should have plenty of time for questions. Feel free to throw those in the chat and then we will be good to go. So like Mike said, what we're gonna be talking about tonight is we're gonna be talking about docs.microsoft.com or Microsoft's newest iteration of documentation uh, that really is the source of truth for everything as you're, whether you're working in Azure, PowerShell, or what have you. And so just kind of a brief intro to who I am. Um, again, my name is Michael Bender. I've been a member of the PowerShell community for a number of years. I'm an author evangelist at Pluralsight. I've got a number of courses on PowerShell, Azure, system admin. I used to work at Microsoft for a smidge bit of time. So that's kind of why I'm um, kind of also up on the doc stuff. And prior to that, I was a college school teacher for a number of years, uh, teaching in the same uh, state as Mike Testy, who I think uh, you've had on your, um, on your user group as well. So I wanted to, I wanted to give a shout out uh, to Sean and Chase and just have them do some quick intros and then we will dive into it. You're on mute, Sean. Oh yeah, Sean and Chase are on mute. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah, hi. <laughs> uh, I'm Sean Wheeler. I uh, am the lead content developer uh, for PowerShell. I took over the content about three years ago um, when I started in the content group at Microsoft, there were six people working on PowerShell. Uh, and for a long time after I took over, it was just me. So it's been a long, hard row to hoe, but uh, hopefully uh, you'll appreciate the progress we've made in the last couple of years. And um, oh, a little bit about me, I've been uh, at Microsoft for almost 21 years. Um, I started in Las Colinas uh, as a support engineer. I spent 10 years as a premier field engineer. Um, I specialized in scripting and uh, network protocol analysis, uh, crash dump analysis. I, I did uh, a little bit of everything. Um, I left for four years, um, uh, went to work for Starbucks in their IT in headquarters. Uh, and then I came back and I came into the docs organization uh, where I am today. Uh, I'm lucky to have a partner in crime. That's uh, Chase Wilson. I'll let him take over. He says lucky, but he's just being nice right now because I'm here. <laughs> My name is Chase. Uh, I've been with Microsoft for coming up on four years now and been on uh, the PowerShell content team for coming up on a year in December. Uh, I was in the military prior to Microsoft and then joined as a consultant out of military service. And uh, I worked in PowerShell pretty much from then until I joined the content world. And that was about two and a half years later. Uh, I worked on a lot of different things with uh, DSC, Pester, and some of the bigger projects out there in the uh, services. And um, yeah, I was very fortunate enough to get on the team with Sean. And he's uh, been learning a lot about content and doing my best to help out the community and uh, being more involved with the community as well, which has been great. So that's uh, yep, what I'm here for. Awesome, great to have you guys here. So what I wanna 
you know, what I wanted to kind of just get from the two of you is, you know, we could talk about docs all night. And, you know, I'd kind of like to get from you. I don't know how many people on the call have dealt with the 27 odd silos of documentation that have existed at Microsoft over the years. And, you know, many of them never got updated in any way, shape or form. Uh, just wondering, you know, share us a little bit about, you know, docs and Sean, it sounds like you've kind of been there since the, you know, kind of the, the beginning of it. So, you know, is there any cool stuff you can share with us as far as the history of it? And I guess really why, why should people really care about docs as opposed <clears throat> to going out to TechNet? Well, yeah, so uh, TechNet and MSDN library are dead. Long live MSDN library and TechNet. <laughs> um, they've been totally replaced by the docs platform. And the biggest difference uh, is well, now there's there's one place to go. Uh, MSDN was supposed to be developer focused. TechNet was supposed to be IT pro focused. And in a DevOps world that we're in today, it, it's all one thing anymore. Um, and so docs is that one thing. Um, and it, it's, uh, from a content perspective, it's a fully open source platform. Um, so almost all of the documentation, um, all of the documentation is in GitHub repos. Um, most of it is in public repos where you can uh, comment, open issues, uh, comment on the documentation, and you can even contribute to the documentation. And that really has allowed us to be much more agile and address the needs of uh, you guys, the users, uh, much more quickly and much more efficiently and really deliver the content you're looking for rather than trying to guess at what it is you need. And awesome. it's, it's just a whole lot more scalable too. Um, uh, you'll you'll get to see from our demos how easy it is to contribute. Um, it's mostly just writing plain text. So, how do you guys manage your pool? Do you guys have a a rota or something to manage issues that are raised, pull requests? Um, just I, maybe you'll get into that. And show us how that works. <laughs> Um, yeah, we'll certainly talk about that. And that varies from content set to content set. And based on the people that are assigned to those content areas. Um, but basically, a content owner like myself um, is responsible for managing the issues that come in and responding to them. Uh, over in the Azure space, the Azure documentation, we also have uh, a whole team of support folks that uh, sort of triage those issues as they come in and try to resolve them before getting the writers involved. Um, uh, but we're not staffed that way for PowerShell. It's just Chase and I. Uh, and so Chase and I try to do our best to stay on top of the issues and respond to them. Uh, but uh, you know, it, it helps if people understand that uh, uh, there's just the two of us behind the curtain. <laughs> so I have a question uh, related to that, something I've always wondered. Um, so, and this is no disrespect to the two of you, but how much do you actually know about PowerShell tech as opposed to just being someone that knows the English language and how to produce good te technical documentation? Like, what is a, the role of a content tech? content dev? Um, again, I think that varies from person to person and what their circumstances of being hired were. Um, I come from a technical background and not a writing background. Um, so I don't, uh, I don't consider myself a writer. I play a writer at work, but <laughs> uh, um, I came from, you know, I, I was a I was a PFE for many years. Mm -hmm. So I was on the front line supporting customers uh, and helping build uh, solutions with scripting. I taught 
uh, VB scripting classes and uh, PowerShell scripting classes to my premier customers. So, mm. yeah, so you're, you're I, using... I don't consider myself. I, I mean, I, I'm a. I would say I'm a power user, but I, I work with experts. I don't consider myself an expert like um, the PowerShell team itself. Well, the reason I ask is because uh, there's a gentleman from the community. His name is Joel Sallow, who's working on. PowerShell yep. and making commits. And while I'm a friend of Joel's and he's presented for our group, there are many topics that he com uh, comments on that I have no idea what the hell he's talking about. <laughs> you know, so at some point, someone has to look at that and go like, this is just that side of my wheelhouse. Yeah, so <clears throat> there's a lot of things as we get issues that uh, Chase and I, Chase and I have, well, until COVID, I sat in the same room with the PowerShell team. Uh, I am not part of their org structure. Uh, Chase and I are not, we're, we're in a different org, but um, the PowerShell team, the PMs, the devs consider us part of their team. Uh, and we meet with them on a regular basis and communicate with them daily and ask questions when, when we need help. It's cool. That's interesting. I'm just curious to see how you keep up with all that. It's it's got to be tough. It it is, <laughs> and yeah. we have a lot of folks out in the community that are very much more knowledgeable. Um, we don't, you know, we can't know everything. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, we try our best. We we can make mistakes, um, uh, but we're we're here to to make sure. Um, uh, to make sure the documentation is done properly and it's uh, th there's quality and uh, it's an iterative process. But that's also a good lead in as to like why it's an open source product, right? There are people in the community that can make meaningful commits yes. that just absolutely help you guys get to the point you want to get to. So it's not a bottleneck of two gentlemen sitting at Microsoft. We have all these things we want to do you just can't get to it. Yep. Yeah, there's, um, and we've gotten a lot more contributions uh, from the community uh, recently. Uh, we've done a lot of uh, work to try to evangelize, uh, there's that word again, uh, community contributions. Um, and I, I think we're, we're making some headway there. Um, and trying to be more open uh, and available to the community to talk about docs and, and get people involved. So, well, I think that's part of the message as well. Is that you know the idea that people say, "Hey, yeah, the docs don't tell me what I needed to know." And you're going, "Well, you, if you figured it out, or you can <clears> say this doesn't say this, and if it's possible, then you guys can actually you know talk to the team and get it done." Or it's just like, "All right, well, here's here's the example that I have." And this is how I solved it. Okay, well then, if that's a viable solution that's been effectively vetted, then go through that process. It's it is there to be now be better for the community at large. Hey, hey, Sean and Michael and yep. Chase, just to interject. Uh, this is Rob. Um, this is a great opportunity to talk to you guys um, tonight because I was on Docs.Microsoft uh, yeah, a couple of days ago, and I picked up on one little trend in the lower left-hand corner, how some areas of it have a little button that says um, generate PDF, um, but others don't. And yeah. What's up with it? Yeah. So that's a, a technical issue. The system that builds uh, the PDF files and the documentation doesn't work for uh, reference content. And um, we'll get into that. Maybe, maybe I should just start sharing yeah. um, and is talk there, about that. Is there any way around that to make that robust and consistent or is um, it still? Yeah. No, it, it's, it's a dev issue. It's um, our engineering team, the, the, they've gotten the feedback. Um, people, we know people want it, um, but it's just, uh, um, 
it, it's on their list of things of many things that they're trying uh, to work on. I don't know where it is in the priority, but uh, yeah. So um, here is the, if you can see my screen, this is the, the docs homepage for PowerShell. Um, and uh, just let me walk through the anatomy here of, of a typical docs uh, page. Um, up here we have the breadcrumbs and below that um, some documentation sets support uh, content for multiple versions of a product. Ours is one of those. So you can choose which version of the product that you want to see help for. Um, right now, all of the conceptual documentation shows up for every version. Um, though Make some it a of it bigger. Uh, let me zoom this page a little bit. How's that? Yeah, that's better. Um, so uh, let me give you an example. So <clears throat> all of this, in, when you're looking at the TOC here, everything uh, up to uh, above reference is what we are calling conceptual content. Um, and if if this doc set was conceptual only, then we could turn on PDF generation. But this section below here, the reference, this is the commandlet reference, and the way that this um, content is generated works a little differently, and the PDF generation does not support this at this time. And, th and that's really the big issue. Um, but a little more about the, the user interface here. Uh, what we have here is the filter box, and you can start typing, uh, and it will filter the articles, um, whatever you type, uh, it'll search the titles. Uh, so let's look at uh, REST method, invoke REST method. And <clears throat> this is also a, sh a quick way to do search. So uh, as you're typing in here, it's a filter, it's not a search. But if, it, if you don't find what you're looking for, you can click here to search for that. Uh, but I'll go ahead and let's pull up. Can you put in wildcards there or is it just a, a regex match? Uh, it's just a straight uh, text match, no wildcards. Okay. Um, so invoke rest method, uh, this is an example where in, in version seven, we have all of these parameters. Uh, there's a ton of new parameters and it works very differently. If I switch the view here to PowerShell 5.1, you see we get a different view. So that's what the version picture picker does for you. Uh, and it's important that when you're looking at the help that you make sure you're looking at the version that you're using so that you get the right help. Um, one of the things Chase and I deal with is down at the bottom of the page, there's these feedback buttons and you can, uh, when you click the uh, feedback for this page, it, uh, you have to sign in to GitHub, but then you can create, uh, you can enter in uh, an issue and it automatically links your issue to the doc you are looking at, but it links it to the version of the doc you are looking at. You'll see here, notice that it's saying PowerShell 5.1. Zoom that, whoops. Um, and we get people filing issues uh, often where they're saying something doesn't work and they're looking at the default version, which is version seven they're actually using PowerShell 5.1 and they're not looking at the right documentation. Um, let me go back to the web page. Um, the other thing about the feedback controls here is um, it, <clears throat> it's important when you're uh, giving feedback that you do it in the right place. If you click uh, feedback for the product, you're giving feedback to the PowerShell team. Um, so 
if what you're trying to report is if like a feature request or uh, something's not working the way you expect, um, might be a bug, that's more product feedback than something you found that works one way, but the documentation says something different than that's, you want to report that uh, about this page, not about the product. So if you click that, that actually takes you to the PowerShell source code repo where you can uh, open an issue. And and I'm betting that you guys must get cross issues all the time because people don't understand that. Yes, all the time. So that's part of our triage process that uh, Chase and I do. Um, The, uh, some other things that uh, I should point out, um, I don't know if you guys have seen recently uh, restructured uh, the table of contents, added some more content. We have a new um, PowerShell 101. This was uh, Mike Robbins donated his book to us and allowed us to republish it here. Um, and so this is, it, it's written for PowerShell 5.1, but the basics apply to any version of PowerShell. Um, and so this is a good place to start learning PowerShell if, if you're still learning. Uh, and then uh, I reached out to um, uh, Kevin Marquette. He had a whole series on his blog um, called Everything You Want to Know About X and some great articles. And it was all information that would be, as I was reading through it, would be great to have in our docs, but it kind of, it's a deep dive, um, kind of out of scope for the type of documentation, especially the reference documentation uh, where we're trying to be a little more succinct and have simpler examples to get you started. These are deeper dives. And so uh, we've, uh, he's allowed us to republish these articles here, um, which has been a great help. So these are ways that, uh, you know, anyone can, can contribute. You can contribute whole articles or, uh, or add information to existing articles. That's super cool. Um, the other thing, and this is one of the areas that I've recently added, is this community section. And every month I create, um, I, I, I add an update here uh, to what's new in PowerShell Docs. So if you click, uh, and, I, and I've collected these by calendar quarter. So we're currently in uh, the third quarter of 2020. And here's the highlights for August. We have two new articles that we published, a new about calculated properties and uh, a new article about doing multi-threaded, getting, using right pro progress with inside of for each parallel loops. So it's sort of multi-threaded progress updates. Um, kind, kind of interesting. Um, and this will link you right to the articles so you can take a look. Um, and finally, this, uh, this is one of those areas that it gets demoed in every class and everything, but it was never documented anywhere about how to do these, um, uh, calculated properties. Uh, also, we recognize the folks that have contributed. Um, so if you did uh, more than one issue in a month and one or more PRs in a month, uh, I'm adding your name to the highlights here. Uh, and we also have an all-time, I'm keeping stats, Hall of Fame, who our contributors are. 
Of course, pull requests that get merged are more valuable. That's where you're actually making changes. Uh, so you can see year over year, we've had a lot of growth in the number of contributions um, from the community. And we have people that have uh, really knocked it out of the park a few times. So that's part of what's in it for you guys, besides just helping us create better content, helping the community by providing better content. We also try to pay you back with some recognition and some goodwill. Awesome. That's some good, that's some cool stuff. So I thought, you know, I think what we wanted to maybe show everybody now is show everybody a little bit about how to go about the contribution process. So how about I, uh, you want to drop off Sean and I will share yep. my content real quick. So before we jump in, we're going to, what we're going to do is we're going to show you, we're going to show you the easy way to go about um, requesting a change for something. And then we're going to show you some, a little bit more, more complex ways to do that. So the first thing what I wanted to do is I just wanted to also, you know, just kind of tag on to what Sean was talking about is that one of the things that I've found that that is often missed by people when they're trying to use docs is what's the right way to use docs? Because if you look at the previous things we had, like MSDN and TechNet, there was really no rhyme or reason. And many of them were just blogs and others were like 500 level deep things. And it was really hard to tell when you went through a search engine, what was what. So what I want to do is I just wanted to quickly show before we jump in our demo, taking a look at the, the Windows Virtual Machines on Azure page here. When you jump into the, the documentation, what you're going to find with most of the products is that they're going to have an overview that's going to basically tell you about virtual machines. So if you're just starting out with virtual machines, you kind of start at the top and you make your way down. The quick starts, what those are going to end up being, and let's take a look at creating the VM with PowerShell. That is going to be, these, these things are like five minutes long. These are things that can, boom, you're doing things really, really super quickly. One of the cool things that you're going to find throughout Docs, and I'm glad that I chose this one, is if you click on the Try It here, I don't think I have this set up properly. You can sign in with your Azure account, and you can actually run the code that's in here. So it allows you to actually test this code out and see how it works, which is, you know, I think it's kind of a real cool feature because it allows you to, you know, kind of practice some of the stuff you're taking a look at. When you get into the tutorial areas, notice here, this is basically going to be a step-by-step -step 15 steps through doing a large type scenario. So these are going to be more in depth than we had with the different quick starts. So when you're looking to go a little bit deeper, you know, take a look at the, the tutorials. Samples are often just going to be samples of different types of code, how to do different things, whether it be with PowerShell or with Azure CLI. The concepts, this is going to be kind of where you're going to get into your deep dive references for specific things. So in this case, you've got your ARM, you've got your VM types. So it's going to get go into that more depth. So for those of you that are looking for more depth than just the creation of VMs and some of the general stuff, this is going to be that place for you to go to really start diving into the product and to, to find, find out how, how to work with it. Then there's going to be an often, depending on the products, they're going to have how-to guides that are going to be basically like nuts and bolts. Here's how you actually work with a specific product. So here's how you work with virtual machines through the CLI, using ARM templates, REST APIs. It's often going to be the really how to do it with all of the different tools that are available. Then, of course, you're going to have different references that are often going to be going to the reference architectures. You know, we've got PowerShell here. Again, going to the PowerShell, the Azure PowerShell documentation for virtual machines. So the, the references are going to be more of 
kind of a footnote of, hey, we talked about Azure CLI in here. What really is Azure CLI? So that's going to have a reference down there to the things that aren't specifically about what we're talking about. And then there's there's different resources in here as well. So you'll find that the table contents for, for many of the, the products are going to be like that. The PowerShell area is a little bit different. I think just because of the platform that it is, that uh, they have it laid out a little bit differently. And I actually like the way that it's laid out. Yeah. And the um, the big difference is Azure, the focus of Azure documentation is to document each of the Azure services. And that services are different than, uh, you know, installable software products. Um, and PowerShell, uh, the, the other difference about PowerShell, the documentation is more like any of our other development languages. We're, we're documenting the language and, and the PowerShell environment. We're not documenting uh, some big service or a uh, larger product like SQL or Exchange or something. Cool. So, and I'm uh, not sure if you showed this before, but yeah. you know, if you go into just the PowerShell documentation at docs.microsoft.com slash PowerShell, and here's, a, here's an interesting tip that I learned when I worked at Microsoft, is that if you remove the en-us slash and just put that URL in, that URL is going to reference to the language of the user that's getting it. So if you want to make these, say you're sharing these URLs with somebody for a presentation or what have you, this is going to make that more inclusive for the end user. So it's going to get it in their preferred language. It's just kind of one of those little uh, tips that I learned going through. So what we wanted to do is we wanted to take a look at, because we found that there were some issues in the stop dash process documentation. And yeah, so now uh, we're getting into, here's a, how you can contribute. There's, there's uh, a couple different ways and we'll start with the, the easy way. <laughs> so the issue we found that Yep, you I had it. it was get, get WMI. WMI. Yep. So we found that there's references to get dash WMI object, and those should actually be, we see in this case, that should be get dash sim instance. So if I wanted to go about and change this, I believe I go up to the top here, I click the little pencil, and I'm already logged into GitHub. So it takes me out to GitHub. It takes me right to the page here. So if I want to make a change here, I believe I click on the little pencil to take me and edit. Puts me in raw here. And well, get dash WMI. So it takes us to the first one. And so I'm just going to go ahead and we're going to change that. And then we'll see if there is another instance of that. We see that there is another instance of that down here. believe that is all we have. So we've got two changes there. So I'm going to go about and propose the change. And I'm just going to be, put a title in here, replace. Before you hit save, I hate to interrupt you, but that last sentence you, you edited is specifically talking about Windows management and instrumentation. So if you're trying to change all these references to some instances, shouldn't you change the content around it as well? Um, in this case, uh, the, uh, it's the same. Uh, it's still WMI. It gets some instance is the new commandlet for working with WMI objects. But yes, um, in general, when you're making a change like that, it, if it changes the context of what's 
uh, being said, you should adjust the text around it as well. In this case, um, there's no context change needed. And be assured that Chase and Sean will, you know, keep you on your toes if you happen to submit something wrong. But that's still a good point. And I think the, the value here is that, hey, look, I can easily change this. I don't need some extra, you know, development tools in order to add in the, I can just do this all from the web page, right? Absolutely. So, so at this point, I just put in a title here. And per Sean, when I was talking with him before, we don't really have to put in a big description here for something of this nature. It, it, this is such a minor change. The the title here captures what what was done. So that's that's fine. If we need more information, um, you'll see what happens. <laughs> we'll, we'll definitely see what happens. We'll, we'll work through that. Go ahead and propose those changes. And then we see that it comes back and it shows there is an errant backtick. So it shows our changes uh, here. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead and submit that and we'll uh, we'll go through the the iteration. And then at this point, uh, this is a template that just comes forward. So I'm just gonna copy my title right into the summary. And then just got some boilerplate stuff. It's going to ask you, what are you making a change to? So at this point, we are making a change to. It it mirrors the TOC, so keep going. Yeah, command lit reference. Command lit reference, and we were working on seven. And you can just put an X in here. We'll also show you a way. I think we'll show you how you can actually do this afterwards. Um, key thing that I learned from Sean was when you put an X in here, you actually have to remove the space. So if you notice that I put an X in there, but then I removed the, the space that was in there. Or an easy way I figured out is if you double click in there, that'll allow you to do it without a space. Because as Scott Hanselman says, we have limited keystrokes in our fingers. So we want to limit the number of keystrokes that we actually use. And mouse, mousing is not working well for me tonight. So, and then this is simply a PR checklist. You need to uh, check off all of those. And then at this point, I can create the pull request. Okay, so now I'm gonna take over and show you what we do from uh, w when we get a pull request like this and how we review it. Uh, let me share my screen. So we've moved on to the next day. Sean comes in, he's got his coffee and he goes, hey, there's a new pull request. Yeah, so we'll go over here to Did we lose Sean? No, nope. sorry, you still there? He looks frozen in space. Oh! I think we got a frozen. He, he's he's deep in thought. <laughs> he, but his, 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 uh, his presentation's frozen too. All yeah. right, Chase, are you pulling it up? What do you got? What do you do? Or we can let him know we lost Chase. Or we lost Sean. I was going to say, you lost both of us. That doesn't bode well. Yeah, that wouldn't bode well. So, right. well, let's see then. I'm back now. Hey. Whew. Right. That was close. Nice. I, I bet you, 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 you want to stop Sean did thing? that just to see Chase sweat. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, Sean's still he frozen. It up, but otherwise, it would have been dripping. Yeah, you're still frozen. So, yeah. Let me see if this is going to. Uh, I, I'm I'm trying what? to share. 
You want to just drop off and come back in? This is the, the picture is the last thing Sean saw before his head exploded from a bad PR. <laughs> <laughs> I, can you guys hear me? We can hear you. Okay. Let me try Audio. sharing again. Audio is fine. It's just a frozen video. Can you see nope. my screen now? Nope. How about you just stop and start again and go back into Teams uh, again? I can see a Drop screen. Oh, yeah. oh. It's the A screen. The magic of editing makes this all disappear. Yeah. We'll 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 drop this off. Is the screen uh, moving? Yeah. Are you still there, Sean? Uh, you see him moving yeah. his mouse, hovering under commits right now. Oh. Huh. I don't get it. I don't. I don't. I don't have it either. Weird. Mike, do you want to, Michael Bender, you want to try and present again and see if you can um, steal it from him? Yeah, let's do that. I'll I'll restart Teams again because it it crashed. I'll be right back. All right. No, no jokes there. Yep. Oh, yep. Back to Michael Bender. All right. So, uh, just a couple couple things while we're we're waiting for Sean. If you remember that list that I was painfully trying to go through and check the things off, you could actually do it on this, the PR summary page here. So you could, you know, if I need to say if it was a different version, I can do that. I don't want to change too much because I don't want to break anything. Um, but you could make that that change as well. Um, and, you know, just some common things is you're going to have the your commits listed here. So we see that we have the the commit that we had put in there, and you could, you know, go in and take a look at that again if you needed to take a look at it. That notice it moved over to the file changes tab, and so notice up here this is something that that's kind of important. And we're gonna once we get done with this part, we're gonna dive into the the gritty world of Git. And so it'll, you know, we're going to get into talk, kind of talking about how to, how you would do this, you know, clone, you know, forking the repo and then, you know, cloning it down and then working through that process. So you see, I'm looking to merge a commit into Microsoft Docs.staging from the Michael Bender dot or colon patch dash one. So patch dash one is when you go through the process that we're going through now of doing it through GitHub, I'm not doing it say locally in say like VS Code or something like we're gonna do it. It's going to do it off with your account and it's gonna it's gonna put that into, is Sean here? I'm back. Patch dash one is a branch, right? Yes. Off of my fork, right? Yeah, so um, why don't we pause for a moment on that because th that's where the yep. graphic I have is going to come in. We can explain that. So let's yep. finish the uh, the process here. Um, let me see if I can share my screen now. There we go. That's your screen. All right. So here's the uh, PR that Michael submitted. And one of the things you'll notice is uh, uh, if you have sufficient rights uh, or you're the creator of the PR, these checkboxes, you can check right here in the interface. That's where he was putting the X's in. Um, and the, the purpose of this PR checklist is uh, really for you guys to tell us that, yeah, you've read our contributor guide and you're following our, our process. Um, uh, remind you that we want a meaningful title to the PR, um, that it's targeted at the staging branch, and we, we'll talk about branches here in a, in a minute, um, that you've updated all the relevant versions, uh, and we'll get back to that. Uh, and if this is resolving an issue, there's a way to close the issue, um, and there's information on how to do that. We'll We'll talk about that if there's time. Uh, and then uh, the, 
this PR is ready to merge. It's not a work in progress. So you can leave that unchecked if you're working on it and you want to, uh, you may want to add to it or make uh, further changes before you're ready to have us review it. So now I come in here and I look at this and I go to the files changed and it will show me what was changed side by side. Um, and I can, I can see here if there's anything, you know, make sure that uh, I agree with the changes that are being made. And so there's some things here that uh, I would want to change that don't match our style guide. So what I'm going to do is add a comment here and I'm going to make a suggestion and per our style guide, which I'll get to, um, commandlet names, when you talk about them, need to be in backticks. Um, classes and uh, object types, things like that, uh, and properties and other things um, are bolded. So in Markdown, that's the, the double asterisk. Um, the, the back tick is a code fence. And so I'm going to start a review and that adds a comment. Uh, and same thing here. Now this is, um, this one's bold. Uh, and so the formatting was inconsistent within the article. Um, that wasn't anything that Michael did, but uh, it's something if we're going to fix this, uh, we might as well go ahead and get it right. So I'm going to add another suggestion. The cool thing about suggestion here is, as you'll see with Michael, um, that he'll be able to click the button to commit the suggestion without having, so it'll it'll accept my change to his change um, and automatically add it. So I'm going to go ahead and finish this and say, I'm requesting changes. And I said, I'll say, thanks for the updates. Please accept the suggestions and then copy the changes to the other versions of this doc. Before you finish that, someone was, well, someone was saying there's a miscellaneous back tick up higher. Was there? I missed it. I wasn't sure if it was a back tick or a space, wasn't there? Or maybe it was just... Terry, would you mind chiming in and telling us where you saw that back tick? Uh, it was up top earlier, up, up, way up. We I think it was line 116. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> all right, for the purposes of this, let's let's just finish this okay. process. We can come back and, and fix that uh, iteration. So, so now or you see. Or one of you can go, go and uh, do that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so now there'll be this commit suggestion button um, available for Michael. Uh, uh, but at this point, I will, I will turn this over to Michael. So, <clears throat> but before I turn it over, um, let's talk about the. Uh, contributors guide. So out here in the community section, there's a contributors guide. And this gives you everything you need to know about how to get started, what tools we use, how to get set up, um, talks about filing issues, submitting changes, um, and our guidelines for each of those. And then there's a style guide here um, that talks about our formatting, requirements and terminology, common terminology. Uh, like it, when you talk about Visual Studio Code, you need to spell it out the first time and then it's abbreviated VS space code uh, and not as one word, VS code. Uh, things like that. Um, use of blank lines and spaces and tabs, uh, how we do our he headings, markdown headings, lists, and so on. Um, so if you're not familiar with Markdown, this will help you get started. Uh, and this covers our style requirements. This one about editing command reference, 
there's <clears throat> specific requirements for formatting in the commandlet reference so that um, it works with our tools that process and publish the documents. The, the markdown source you see out here serves two purposes. Uh, it create, it's, it's the source code for the web pages that get published, and it's the source code for the in console help displayed by Git help. And so the tools we use to transform the markdown to, for Git help um, require a, a certain format structure to commandlet reference. So these are all the rules for how that works. <coughs> So um, if we basically build like examples and stuff that we want to put up to here, those examples actually get into the installable help that we install and people will see all over the run. It's not just on the web page, right? Correct. Um, That's cool. And then some other things here under additional resources, this editorial checklist. Um, this is sort of a summary of everything that's in the style guide, but um, this is a good bullet list summary that you can used to go through your um, the documents that you've <clears throat> worked on and make sure you've covered all of the things that uh, we do. Does it go through any linting checks in order to do all that stuff or? <clears throat> just need to... um, there's not specific linting checks for style. There is linting checks for uh, markdown <laughs> syntax. So there, there is valid markdown syntax that may break Platy PS, which is the tool we use to transform the markdown. Um, and then these other two articles here, how we manage issues. This, this kind of gets into our triage process and the labeling we use um, and so on, and how we manage pull requests. Um, we're trying to give, uh, you know, make this transparent to everyone. So, um, you know, there's no hidden agendas here. This is, this is how we try to operate. Um, and this is how we want you to engage with us. Um, so with that said, um, I've made those suggestions to Michael. Now I'll turn it back over to Michael so he can finish out this PR. You're muted, Michael. So we're back here on our PR. I think I go over here to the yeah, conversation. Yeah. Conversation. And so if we go down here, we see validation checks gone through. Sean has given me some suggestions, resolve those, see that changes are requested, merging has been blocked because that needs to be authorized on the back end. And so at this point, I think a few changes, right? Um, uh, go back to the top, uh, files change. Yeah, so <clears throat> there's two buttons there. There's commit suggestion, and when if you did commit suggestion, um, that adds a commit which triggers the build to start over. Um, and, and if there's multiple suggestions to be committed, you can commit them as a batch, but that's the other button, and that requires you to be in the files changed view. Ah, yes. That's what we <clears throat> ran into last night was yeah. the files changed view. So now you can click the button that says add suggestion to batch. And then click okay, that second one. Second one. And then you commit suggestions to there, e either one of those. So that commits both changes in one commit. So now, um, 
if if that were all that needed to be done, I could accept the PR and merge it once the build validation completes. <clears throat> However, I also asked uh, Michael to make the same change to the other version. So there's four versions of this article published uh, for PowerShell 5.1, uh, PowerShell 6, 7.0, and 7.1. So Michael, you wanna? Yep. So let's go back to the screen. So I'm going to, I am going to two screen us here. I'm going to go ahead and bring up, we're going to start with Visual Studio Code. So I basically, I already have, so if you recall, Sean showed that contributor's guide. So I've already gone through the process of creating a fork of the PowerShell docs on GitHub. I have cloned that down to my local system. So I should be ready to go. We'll see that in a in a second here because we are dealing with, with Git here and I am an IT pro. So um, those two things put together mean that we might may or may not get this right. So <laughs> first area that I've gone into, if you see in the reference area, once these are Clone down, see we have seven one, seven, six, and five one. So I'm gonna go ahead and go into the five one and we'll expand this out just so we can actually see it. It's under PowerShell management. And if we go down to stop process. We see there's our git dash wmi object. It's the correct way. So effectively, this is the same process, but it's just using it in the raw code in the in the GitHub, you know, in the code behind the scenes. Is that correct? Right. So um, the the simple a simple change can be done through the GitHub UI. But if you need to change more than one file, the GitHub UI uh, is more difficult. Each change becomes a new PR. Um, when you have multiple things that are all related, you can make all of your changes locally um, and using Git and submit those in one PR. What we're doing here is um, uh, did you so michael you you've branch you've missed a step uh, but i'll let you finish editing here did we forget to ah yes we forgot to go to patch one right uh yeah so, so uh, what you need to do is uh, yeah you need to um pull do a get fetch origin And hit enter. Okay, now do it. And then now check out branch patch one. So what happens is um, when you did that through the GitHub web interface, it created that branch called patch one in your fork automatically. And in fact, if you don't have a fork, it creates a fork, and then creates a branch. So get checkout. I think it's checkout. Uh, yeah, get checkout. Checkout. Uh, no, just patch one. Yep, and so now um, if you open the, the version seven, it should already have the changes. Yeah, no results. Yep. Yeah, so you see they got those changes, so cool. Uh, and you need to change 7.1.
You need to save your changes to six. <laughs> I don't know if you finished. Let's get the last one. There we go. And then 7.1. So if somebody's more familiar with, you know, this process than living in Git, it, it is a very easy process for them to just jump in here and move them things around and even yeah. copy code around and you know use the format. So I think it, it is worthwhile to know that, hey, this is available to you if you wanted it. Do you typically get more um, suggestions or changes regarding like, you know, additions to, you know, hey, here's a new example, here's that kind of thing, or is it you know, um, two, slash, two back to clear, Michael? I would say we, um, the, uh, most of the changes we get from the community are clarifying, um, details where the current wording might be confusing or incomplete or um, in some cases we get some new examples um, and the other bulk of what we get is people fixing typos or, or grammar problems or things like that so the, <clears throat> um, we rarely get you know big weighty contributions um, but we are open to to accepting those. Um, and depending on what it is that you want to do, we you know we may either push back or it may be better to start with an issue to discuss the change you want to make before spending a lot of time making the change. Cool. Take the suggestion. Uh, all right, yep. now um, yep, you need to add your changes. Yeah, dash dash all. And, oh wait, um, you, you haven't, yeah, right. And now you need to commit them. It's single dash M. Just get that screwed up. So. Yep. Now you need to push to origin. All right. So now let me take over. Uh, And you guys should see my screen. Yep. And I'll go back to the PR. And I'm going to refresh the page here. But one of the things you can see is uh, Michael added new commits right here and it kicked off a new build. Now, uh, so right here, there's, there's two tasks that have to run that do the build and validate the changes that are, that are being merged. Um, there's the open publishing build, um, and then there's the PowerShell Docs CI, and the PowerShell Docs CI is what uh, actually builds the cab files for updatable help. 
it's doing, you know, the the get help portion of the build. The open publishing build does the website portion of the build. But the other thing that happens when you make a contribution, you need to sign the contributor license agreement. So you'll notice that uh, this is still yellow. It hasn't this this check hasn't passed. It's pending, and there is a comment here from the Microsoft CLA bot that's telling you, hey, Michael, you need to sign this. So, Michael, if you would click the sign now and go ahead and sign that. What the contributor license agreement is, is uh, basically it's it's granting Microsoft rights to the changes you made. Um, so that we can do with, the, we can use them however we deem appropriate. Um, and this is a one-time thing. Once you've signed the contributor license agreement, you won't be asked to do that uh, anywhere else on docs. So now that's go. been met and we go down here and you can see that's a green check mark now. So now we're just waiting for um, the PowerShell docs CI job to finish. So you and said that, C, that CLA is, is across doc, that's all docs, you know, all docs. Docs. PowerShell. Yeah. yeah. Anything on docs.microsoft.com. So also a lot of this is focused directly, you know, we're talking about PowerShell, the PowerShell docs, but the same overall process is still applicable for, you know, if you wanted to update the Azure help or Azure docs or other things. Now, granted, some of their their pipeline may be slightly different, but the overall arching you know process is close to this. Yes, it's very much uh, the same. They might have different style guidance uh, based on the the needs of their content set, um, but it it's the same. The other thing that's a little bit different in the Azure space is when you make a contribution, you're making a contribution to a public repository, but there's the source of truth is a private repository and the changes are synced between the public and the private. So what happens in Azure when you, if you submitted a PR, the actual owner of that document that you modified reviews your PR and signs off on it. And then it gets merged to the public side. And then, um, once a day, there's a job that merges the changes in public into the private side, and then those eventually get published to the web page. Cool. Um, where would we go to start a conversation about doc changes? Or if we had an idea, uh, where, where would we go to do that? So for PowerShell, that's just opening an issue in GitHub, in the docs, PowerShell docs repo. And I posted a link to the actual issue site in there for you, Mark, as well. Yeah, so let's just go there. Um, here's, here's all of our open issues. We have 74 currently open. And when you click the new issue button, you'll pre be presented with some options here. And these are issue templates. Um, so you want to choose the right issue template. If you're... Uh, if there's a problem, an error you found in documentation, you want this documentation issue. Uh, if you're, if you have an idea about changing a document uh, or, or making significant changes to a document or creating a new document, you want this document idea. Um, and then this first one is mostly for the PowerShell team to um, to create docs issues for feature changes or uh, you know, things that they've changed in a new release. And so when you click on one of these, um, you'll get a template just like you did for the PR. You wanna change the title here to be a meaningful title of what it is you're reporting. You provide a description here under issue description. Um, you provide a URL to link to the the source in GitHub or uh, the docs page. That helps us 
know which doc you're talking about. Um, and then we've got check boxes here for, you know, what portion of the docs does it relate to? Is the problem uh, platform specific? Like it only applies to Windows or Linux or whatever. Uh, and then here's a detailed description. So the description at the top should just be a brief description of what the problem is. And then you can go into as much detail as you want here at the bottom. And when you do that, <clears throat> it'll get added to the list of issues here. Um, and Chase and I triage these uh, several times a day and they, as they come in. And we add these labels, you see, these colored labels. So by default, it's going to add the question label. And um, well, this is an example of one. This is one that was entered using the feedback control on the bottom of the web page. So remember I, when I showed you that? And it links it to the version specific document that you were viewing at the time you clicked the feedback button. Uh, and so all of this information here is created automatically when you click that feedback button. Um, so that helps us uh, uh, link that stuff. But if you come directly to GitHub and create a new issue, um, like let's let's take this one. I think this is one that's not linked. Well, it is. Um, but you can see there's people, th this is an example of a community contributor that's very prolific. Um, and he gives very detailed, uh, in-depth information. He knows more about PowerShell than Chase or I. And we often have to work with uh, the devs and the PMs to review what it is he's saying and uh, how we respond to this stuff. But um, anyway, the, the, the purpose of the templates is it helps you provide the information we need to have the discussion. And then we'll go back and forth with comments in the issue um, and come to a conclusion decision about uh, whether to go forward or not and, and what the direction should be. And just realize that you know how electronic communications are. Um, written comments sometimes can be terse uh, especially with the volume of stuff that we have to deal with. Um, we're, we're not trying to be mean or nasty. <laughs> uh, we're just very busy, so try not to take things personally, and we try not to take things personally uh, that get submitted to us. Um, so... So did you approve that thing that Mike just said? Uh, I have not approved it yet. Um, or what's the workflow beyond that? Uh, so yeah, the workflow beyond that, let me go back to it. And come on. So it's still building because it's got the yellow dot. We're waiting for all the lights to go green. And when it's uh, when this finishes, um, I'll, I'll be able to merge it. I could override and merge it because uh, I have admin rights. Um, but one of the things, this details link here, um, it's there. You'll be able to click it, but you won't have rights to the back end where this uh, job is running. Um, and we can see that the CI job is still running. Oh, it just finished. All right, so if I go back here, yep, it's all green. So I've already looked at the changes. I know what's happened. I can go in here and approve the changes. And now I can merge the pull request. And what I'm gonna do is 
squash and merge. And so for those that aren't familiar with Git, the squash and the merge is basically take he had multiple commits and he was changing. And so it basically puts it all into one commit and now merges just effectively one commit. Is that correct? Yes. Um, and the important part here too is that the staging branch is our branch where we do all of our work. Uh, I mean, you should you should create a, a uh, and we'll get to the GitHub workflow here in a minute, but you should create a working branch and then submit a pull request to merge your working branch into staging. And then uh, once a day, Monday through Friday, the staging branch is merged into the live branch and we build the website from the live branch. So it may take a day before your changes show up on the web. They're, they will be there immediately uh, in GitHub, but the change won't show up on the web for uh, and, until it's merged to live. So <clears throat> let's let's dig in a little deeper to the GitHub workflow. Um, so really, there's three copies of the repo at work here. The, the Microsoft Docs slash PowerShell doc, dash Docs repository, that's, that is the, the master, the, the source of truth for all of uh, the content. And uh, as a community contributor, you don't have rights to make changes directly there. So what you have to do is you have to make a copy of it, and that's called, in GitHub, that's creating a fork. And so um, Michael already had a fork in his user account, the Michael Bender slash PowerShell dash docs. Um, and uh, these arrows in red are things that happen, that only need to happen once. So first thing you do is you have to make a fork and that, that makes a copy of the repository up in GitHub. And then you need to clone your fork down to your local machine. And then you need to create a remote called upstream that points back to Microsoft Docs, PowerShell Docs. And all of this is in the details in the contributor guide. Um, this isn't the full syntax that you see here, but it, this kind of helps you understand the, the flow. So that's a one-time step. Once you're set up, uh, then you can use your your Git environment uh, over and over and uh, continue to make changes and contributions. The blue steps are the things that you do on a regular basis when you're making contributions. So the first thing you need to do is you need to pull the latest version from upstream. Since upstream points to Microsoft Docs, what you're doing is you're you're copying all the changes that have happened in the staging branch down to the staging branch in your local machine. And then you want to push all of those changes from your local machine up into your fork. When you do that, the, the three repositories are all in sync now. So at that point, we can go to um, this next step um, where you check out your working branch. So you do a git checkout dash B and you, you can create a branch and you can name it anything you want. And this is what this does is uh, it creates a safe space for you to make changes. Um, you're not making them directly in the staging branch. You're doing it in a working branch. Um, once you've created that branch, you can then edit the files that you want to make changes to using uh, VS Code or whatever editor you want. Um, and then you add those uh, changes and commit those changes. And that writes those changes into your working branch in your local repository. Once you've done that, you can then 
push those changes, you push your working branch into your fork. And now your fork has a copy of the working branch. Then you go back into GitHub and you create a pull request. And that sends your working branch to us to be merged into staging. So in that same workflow, I, I kind of understood this whole workflow. In, in this example that Michael did, is that branch, that working branch, was effectively created in the GitHub, and then he simply pulled down that working branch, that path, that path yes. one. Yep. So he just skipped over that step because the, the, the GitHub web interface did it for him. And then, but otherwise, if you wanted to do it without the whole web interface thing, you could have just done it. It's kind of closer to that. That's correct, just to be clear. And we did that because what that ended up doing, that ended up putting the change that I made on GitHub into the same PR as, it, is that yeah. correct? Yeah, so once you've created a PR, it, as long as we haven't merged it, you can keep adding things to the same branch, push push those changes into your branch in, into that branch in your fork, and that updates the open PR. Mm -hmm. So that's what we did. Um, yep. Cool. Awesome. Okay, so, and, <clears throat> yeah, go ahead. I was just going to go, uh, any other questions? I know we covered a lot of stuff and I just looked at the time and I'm like, wow, that's how, that's how an hour and a half goes. You know, that's COVID time. <laughs> um, so I know Chase has been jumping in there and getting a lot of the questions done. Were there any other things that uh, we could maybe answer questions for, for anybody? Well, I don't have a question. I just, the point of, of seeing Microsoft use, first of all, its own tools and seeing just the vanilla usage of GitHub, like I see GitHub or everywhere else, seeing Platypus being used, really cool to see all those tools that you hear about in the community actually being used uh, in production like that. So I also, one thing I didn't hear mentioned, and I'm sorry, I had to step away before, I heard that when you make the commit, it's sort of live, but it doesn't show up on the web for about a day. I understand that. What about the process to make it back to the code that would get run when you do an update help? How long does it take for that? So when we publish to live, um, we publish, we also publish updated cab files for update help. So all you have to do is run update help slash dash force and you'll get the new content. Is the dash force a requirement? It is because right now we don't have a, um, a way, a reliable way to bump the version. So the way update help works is it looks at the version of the help that's installed on your machine and then it goes and looks at the version of help that's available for download. And if the version is the same, uh, it won't download it unless you do dash force. And right huh. now we're not, we're not changing that version number. So you have to do the dash force to tell it to download. Huh. So I'll, we're trying I'll, to add some automation to bump that, uh, but that's, that's a work in progress. Did not know that. That's an awesome tip. Yeah, the, the idea is, especially when this, remember, PowerShell's 10 years old now. When we started this, uh, internet speeds were a lot slower, and some of it was still dial-up. <laughs> yeah. So downloading a big help file uh, could take a while and wasn't something that you should do, you know, multiple times a day or you know, all that often, and you only want the things that have changed. So that was the idea behind the uh, design. These days, it probably would, wouldn't matter. For some people, and some yeah. people still live on a T1. Yes. <laughs> all right. That's pretty right. cool. I thank you guys for coming and, uh, you know, sharing your insights. I want to certainly 
open it up and if anybody has any more questions. But uh, I think that was pretty informative, and I like to look. I really enjoyed seeing behind the curtain and seeing what it takes to get content updated, and just even what docs look like overall. So I think it's been a really good session. Cool. Thanks for having us. Uh, I'm willing to do more of this and deep dives in other areas. I did write an article uh, about a month ago about how to use Platy PS to create help the same way we do. So you can create your own updatable help. So that's out there in our doc set. So it's actually just in the, the documentation, one of the pages? Yep. I feel like uh, a lot of this help information has been hiding in plain sight because I've yeah. gone to docs.microsoft many times and used help, but I don't know that I actually did the content picker, the, the drop down list. And I don't know that I realized that there was a lot of like conceptual stuff in there as well. And, and, and I'm not saying that it's not there. It's just a habit that I go, I find my help and I move on, not realizing there's a lot of ancillary information that's useful there. Yep. So, so one comment I thought of, and I and I, I feel bad lobbing comments across the way as you guys are doing a presentation, but I think those buttons. We know you don't page, like. You know you just like the <laughs> curve grenades in the middle of uh, those crowded square. Those those buttons on the bottom, I I take a little uh, I, I take a little I have a little issue with the buttons because the the button says leave feedback leave feedback. So feedback could be, hey, I think this is great, but what it actually does is open an issue. Yes, um, and this actually changed. The, the user interface for this changed recently. It used to be we had our own form for you to enter feedback, and on the back end it was creating an issue, but then it would display um, the contents of the issues here on this page. And we had some problem with spammers that were putting inappropriate content in that we couldn't um, moderate fast enough. So we had, they had to change. Is, is Sean the way sharing the this, screen? No, I'm not. Oh, I thought you were pointing at something. That's why I just wanted to make sure. Um, well, I'm gesticulating. <laughs> I can share gotcha. my screen. That's Warning, fine. inappropriate content. <laughs> yeah. Submitted by Mike again. No, no, no. <laughs> Let me share my screen. So with these buttons here, it used to be when you uh, clicked on this, you would see all of the open issues that had been submitted through the feedback control. Um, but like I said, th there was inappropriate content being put in those in that feedback and it would sit there for hours or days before somebody could triage it uh, and it, it it was just it was bad there were, and there was legal issues and things so basically they had to change the way this this works and unfortunately um, it's not the greatest user experience that's all right I mean look this was awesome tonight it's great to really see the behind the scenes things. I love seeing how that stuff works. And to see that it's the, basically the same git commits that I'm doing all day long is pretty yep. interesting to see that on a grand scale. Yeah, and I think one of the other cool things is, is actually he was down there at the bottom is I never realized it, or at least I saw somebody do it, but that it has a theme at the bottom. You can change the theme. So I like mine black on white. And if you go to the, if there's a high contrast and a, so you can choose different themes and oh, it's so much better. It's click dark. Ooh. Ah. Yeah. So Life's just fine. another another thing, another people just just to, if other people want to see, but it's just interesting. I think too. Can I, if you I'm just gonna throw out a comment to that. If you're presenting <laughs> as a presenter, dark mode is the absolute worst presentation theme that you can use. So when you put this onto a projector. And oftentimes, even through Zoom meetings, it's very, very difficult to read. So you might like using personally that, but I would highly dissuade you from, if you're going out and presenting somewhere, of using any form of dark mode. Because as much as it's inclusive and it's very good for people when they're watching it, 
for presentations, it it really bleeds everything out, and people can literally not read what you have on the screen. All right, Mike, here's my hand. You can slap it. <laughs> no, uh, and that's exactly. Oh, I thought I thought that was Mike. I'm sorry, Phil. <laughs> um, yeah, I I purposely have left my theme as the 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 light mode for that reason, because it is it does make it hard to read when you're presenting. But yeah, this is the article I was talking about, uh, and this this walks you through. This is the the, the flow chart that says how we use Plat EPS uh, and, and the steps. So the article takes you through the steps you see in the flow chart here. Uh, so you could you could create um, help files for your own modules, compile them into MAML, uh, and ship them with your module or uh, host them on a website so you could have updatable help. So this feels like a, a natural break here since we haven't had too many other questions. Let me let me click stop on the record here. I'll just end by saying thank you to Microsoft for spending time with us this evening. Thanks for Michael Bender for coming along and helping us get through this content. Really appreciate this, guys. It's turned out to be another fantastic meeting and really appreciate the uh, efforts by you guys. So with that, we're going to say good night to all. <laughs>